I'll call the conference committee um, to get um, to order on uh, House File 740. It looks like most of us have arrived. The uh, Senate, of course, was on time. Um, of course. So, uh, my, Thank you for noting that. Yes. <laughs> we do have a quorum on both sides. So um, we're, we're going to start with a, 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 a quick overview of the bill itself, uh, where we are, so that everybody uh, is on track, because I'm not sure if everybody has been through committee on this or not. So uh, we could have um, um, Ms. Ms. Popo, um go over the, the, the bill and um, see where we're at. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, Chair and members, House File 740. Uh, the first section deals with warranty obligations to dealers. Uh, subdivision 1 deals with manufacturers' obligations to new motor vehicles that they have to provide in writing to their dealers. Um, the dealer's obligation to uh, prepare, deliver, and provide service on the products uh, that the manufacturer has to compensate dealers uh, for the parts and labor that the manufacturer requires them to expend in repairing vehicles pursuant to the warranty. If you go on to subdivision two, this is the process by which a dealer creates the percentage markup that will apply to parts. If you turn over to page two, um, this just provides the system by which the calculation is provided. Um, if the manufacturer disapproves of the dealer's calculation, how that is dealt with, which is through the manufacturer's internal resolution dispute process, and if that is unsuccessful, um, that a civil suit is available under section 80E.17 to the uh, auto dealer. Uh, there are exclusions down on line 2.26 uh, for warranty-like repairs that are excluded from this calculation, such as parts sold at wholesale, tires and labor, accessories, parts that are not part of the original equipment of the car. If you go into subdivision 3, uh, parts at no cost or reduced cost, this provides the calculation um, to determine the fair wholesale value of a part that the manufacturer provides to the dealer and the markup that will apply to that. If you go into subdivision four, retail rate for labor, this creates the calculation um, that the dealer will use with the manufacturer to determine what the dealer's retail rate for labor is as applicable to the manufacturer. And again, it provides that same system where if the manufacturer disapproves, then of the dealer's calculation, they go through the manufacturer's internal resolution dispute process. If that is unsuccessful, then the dealer can file a civil suit under 80.17. On to page four in subdivision five, time for establishing rate. Um, the rates for parts and labor can only be established once per year by the new car dealer, and that the dealer has to give the manufacturer certain notice when they're going to uh, do these calculations. On to subdivision six, cost recovery prohibited. Um, this prohibits manufacturers from otherwise reclaiming funds that they have expended because dealers choose to use these calculations for parts and labor. Uh, on to page five, subdivision seven, payment of claims. Um, this is the process by which the Dealers will submit claims for parts and labor to manufacturers, the time periods that the manufacturers have to pay these claims, um, and that um, clerical errors, uh, if they do not call into question legitimacy of the claim, are not the basis for denying a claim from a dealer to a manufacturer. If you go into subdivision eight, um, this clarifies that the obligations of this section are the dealer's only responsibility for a product and that this does not create liability based in um, civil law. Uh, subdivision 9, definitions, this clarifies that manufacturers include distributors and manufacturers and distributors include um, distributors of motor vehicle engines and not just cars and dealer includes dealers of new motor vehicles and engines. And uh, subdivision 10, it's a violation of this section for a manufacturer to fail to perform any warranty obligations it undertakes under the, their own warranty. On to section two, recall repairs, manufacturer and dealer obligations. Um, manufacturers under subdivision one are required to compensate new motor vehicle dealers for uh, 
the repairs and parts that they have to expend in repairing cars that are part of a do not drive or stop order? And uh, further on line 6.6, .6, it clarifies that a stop sale or do not drive means a notification issued by the manufacturer to its dealers stating that used vehicles that the dealer has in inventory cannot be sold or leased due to a federal recall for a defect, a non-compliance recall, or a federal emissions recall. Uh, subdivision two, um, value of vehicle provides that the value of a used vehicle is the average trade-in value as indicated in an independent third-party guide. S Subdivision three provides that this section applies only to used vehicles subject um, to safety or emissions recalls with that stop sale or do not drive order. And uh, two new motor vehicle dealers that are holding used vehicles for sale that are part of their normal franchise line makes that they sell. Subdivision four, violations. It's a violation of the section for a manufacturer to reduce the amount of compensation they otherwise pay a new dealer because the dealer takes advantage of uh, this reimbursement procedure. Subdivision five, payment of claims. This is similar to the payment of claims in the prior section. Um, claims have to be submitted uh, by the dealer to the manufacturer. The manufacturer has to approve those claims within a certain time period. They're is an alternative in this section where uh, a manufacturer can compensate its franchise dealers under a national recall compensation program, provided the program is equal or greater to that provided under subdivision one. On to page seven, section three, succession agreements. Um, this allows a new motor vehicle dealer to apply to a manufacturer, distributor, or factory branch to um, have their successor to the dealership established as long as that successor does not, um, their control would not result in executive management control by a person who is not of good moral character or who does not meet the franchisor's existing capital standards or does not meet the franchisor's uh, minimum business experience. Um, if the manufacturer, distributor, or factory branch um, do not allow a dealer's successor, they must deny the successor in writing, offer an explanation, it must be within a certain time period, um, and if they don't do it within that time period, the successor is uh, deemed to be acceptable to the manufacturer. And then on to section four. Several pages in on page 11, this would be 11.16. Um, it is uh, an unfair practice for a dealer uh, by agreement, program, incentive, or otherwise to adhere performance standards that are not applied uniformly to other similarly situated dealers. And then on to paragraph two, um, a franchise dealer in Minnesota can uh, request from a manufacturer, distributor, or factory branch that they provide the method or formula that the manufacturer would use to determine the sales incentive program. Um, the information that they provide um, has certain parameters. Um, they would have to be motor vehicle dealers of the same line make within 75 miles and um, Nothing in the subdivision requires the manufacturer to disclose uh, protected information to the new motor vehicle dealer. On to page 12, um, uh, a manufacturer cannot assign or change a dealer's area of sales arbitrarily without due regard to the present pattern. And then um, further on page 12, it goes into uh, at an evidentiary hearing with a manufacturer and a new car dealer what is considered a dealer's sales area and what is a change to the dealer's sales area. Um, the information that the court has to take into consideration include traffic patterns, patterns of sale, growth and population, presence of natural geographic obstacles or boundaries, census tracts, um, the reasonableness of the proposed change. Um, and then on to page 13. On 13.14, um, a manufacturer cannot require a dealer uh, to construct improvements to a predecessor's facility or install new signs or franchise or image elements um, or alter improvements substantially. 
um, if the franchisor has completed improvements like that within the past 10 years um, <coughs> that were required by the franchisor. And then section five uh, corrects the cross-reference as this bill does repeal ADE.04. And on the last page, they're effective the day following final enactment. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Um, the Senate care to comment um, their staff on any differences? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, just real briefly, the Senate does not have any language, uh, Section 1 of the House Bill Warranty Obligations to Dealers. Senate does not have any language on that. Uh, section two of the House bill is, is the recall repair section. The Senate has no language on that. Um, section three of the House bill um, on succession agreements, I believe the language is very, very similar between the, the, uh, the two bodies um, other than um, formatting, I think, and uh, maybe a, a minor cross-reference. Otherwise, I think the language is essentially uh, the same with respect to the succession agreements. Um, section four of the House bill and section two of the Senate bill, the unfair practices. Um, there are a few differences there. I think it's fair to say that as they stand now, the, the House language is probably a little more protective of dealer rights and interests. Um, One thing I'd point out is uh, on page 11 of the House bill, uh, line 16, when they talk about performance standards and how they're required, the, uh, the House includes by agreement and uh, that was taken out of the Senate bill. So the Senate bill does not have that anymore. Uh, the House, um, provides that uh, the performance objective is deemed to be unreasonable if, if the uh, manufacturer doesn't make the disclosure required. The Senate does not have that language. Um, the Senate just gives a dealer the right to bring an action uh, without a showing of in injury if the disclosure was not made other than having it deemed to be unreasonable uh, from the start. Uh, the House bill contains a definition of dealer's market and market, which the Senate bill does not include. Um, and then in the section dealing with improvements to the dealership, uh, the Senate has an exception to, to that new language um, where it does not apply to a program that provides lump sum payments to assist dealers in making facility improvements uh, as further described in 729 to 734 of the Senate bill. So that's, that's another difference. So the short version is the Senate has nothing on warranty obligations or recall, almost identical on succession, and there are a few differences in the uh, uh, area of sales effectiveness and performance standards section. Thank you. Any questions? Um, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just curious on the differences in the recall and the warranty um, for the Senate. Uh, do you believe by leaving those out that those sections are fine or are you just leaving them out because we don't want to discuss them? Uh, Representative Thoms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, the, the, our bill is what's been agreed to by the manufacturers and the dealers. We spent, I don't know how many hours in a meeting with both sides, manufacturers, dealers, and they worked this out and agreed to those four pieces. We agreed to bring those four pieces to our committee and hear those and did not include the other pieces because we want them to get those worked out. So that's why our language is what it is and it's different from what's in this bill is because this is what's been agreed to by both parties. So that's why the differences are in there. Mr. Chair. Representative Krisha. Follow up. So I'm just gonna go back to do so then you believe those two sections, recall and warranty, in practice are fine, we don't need to look at them? Is that what you're saying? I, I understand what you're saying, that there's an agreement. I'm asking, take that side of the room out, 
and let's go legislative. Do we believe those practices are fair and going okay right now? I Senator believe, Dames. Thank you, uh, Representative. I believe that these practices are what we should move forward because that's what's been agreed to by both parties. I guess, Mr. Uh, Representative Krisha. I, and I appreciate that, Senator Deans. I, it still doesn't get, my bigger question is, I mean, why I think we're here as legislators, I wanna know, are those working in practice? Um, that's my biggest question. If, they're, if they are great, I'm happy to agree. If they're not working and I have to go back to my district and I have to hear this is not working, I'd like to know so we can address that. That's all I'm asking. Well, that's a very good uh, question. Senator Deans. I would assume that people feel they work or they probably wouldn't agree to them. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Krisha. <laughs> I appreciate that, but you've left it out, we put it in. I'm just trying to ask that. the question, Yeah, maybe we can at least look at it. I, and I don't care what the answer is. I just would like to know what is the answer. Are they working or are they not working in practice? Well, we Senator don't Dames. if they're gonna work because none, for the most part, neither one of these bills are, are implemented right now. So you're asking me if I can verify if they're gonna work when they're not in, they're not, they're not in application right now. And, um, maybe, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I had uh, agreed to take some testimony. Um, and, and Representative Vogel. Re uh, Representative Krisha. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Representative, or Senator Deans. I'm not trying to make it, no, no, I I'm just trying to understand the language. Yeah, and, and Mr. Senator. Chair, I think I misunderstood your question. You're asking if the sections that are not in our bill are working? Correct, today. I'm, I'm not saying that they are working. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying that we need to, the both sides need to come to an agreement to make them work. I'm not saying they're Agreed. working. No, I'm not saying that. That's at all. all I, I, and I was just, I was asking because they didn't know. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I missed what you, no, I, I'm not saying they're working, but I'm saying they need to get them worked out so they do work. That was okay. the end. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Yep. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Okay. I will go through the chair uh, from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to abuse the newcomer here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 right. uh, I had agreed to take some testimony. I would appreciate if everybody, if people that want to testify could keep this down to two minutes or so because, um, uh, you know, obviously there's been a lot of discussion on this as you can see already, uh, but I think it's important since the parties haven't agreed yet and some of the people here at the conference committee haven't heard all of the the testimony maybe going through committee that that people have a chance so um, if um, whoever would like to uh, come up first I don't have a list um, please identify yourself uh, for the record and uh, welcome good morning Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus. I'm the Director of Government Affairs with the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association, and we represent its 370 franchise new car and truck dealers who employ 20,000 Minnesotans. Um, our members are extremely passionate about the issues in the House version of Section 1 and 2 of the bill, and I would have preferred a member to come in and testify this morning, but no one was willing to go on the record publicly for fear of retribution. Our position is that the current system is not working. If manufacturers were following the law as it currently stands, MADA would not have brought a bill forward. Existing law in ADE.04 says the reimbursement for warranty services shall not be less than the rate charged by the dealer for like service to non-warranty customers for non-warranty service and repairs. Unfortunately, our member dealerships have seen that reimbursement rate erode over the past few years. In a survey of MADA service directors, only 17% thought they were being treated fairly by the manufacturer when it comes to warranty reimbursement, with 86% receiving compensation for parts that is below their customer pay jobs, and 93% receiving compensation for labor that is below their customer pay as well. <clears throat> Through the language vetted in two House committees and overwhelmingly approved by that body, we hope to provide more specificity by laying out a formula and statute similar to what 26 other states have adopted and that has been upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court that will stop the erosion of the reimbursement rate for warranty work and allow our dealers to be paid what is already required under Minnesota law. Additionally, the warranty language in Section 1 of the House file also prohibits the manufacturers from de denying payment because of clerical errors or taking the money owed for warranty reimbursement on the front end by allowing the manufacturers to put a surcharge on the price they charge dealers for vehicles. Without these provisions, our members will routinely see tens of thousands of dollars of compensation denied because of a transposed number or a missing signature. 
The reason we have not reached agreement with the factories on the warranty reimbursement provision has come down to whether the state will allow manufacturers to surcharge Minnesota dealers in exchange for receiving market rate reimbursement as already required by law. Surcharging puts Minnesota dealers at a competitive disadvantage with dealers in neighboring states and will cost Minnesota consumers more as a representative from the factories testified to in house civil law. As we talked with our members about solutions to address the underpayment of dealers on warranty work, it elicited a bigger discussion on instances where the manufacturers are not treating their franchise dealers fairly. In section two of the House bill, our goal is to keep dealers whole in the event their manufacturer demands they stop selling used vehicles with an open recall that doesn't pose a threat to the vehicle's safety or operations. When a stop sale is ordered, our dealers are left paying interest and incurring storage costs on vehicles they cannot sell, while the competitor down the street, who has the same vehicle in its inventory, can sell it without any restrictions since they are not bound by the franchise agreement. These stop sales also hurt consumers as they diminish the value of vehicles for trade-ins. The language in section two of the House bill reflects an agreement reached on stop sale compensation with the 12 manufacturers who comprise the global automakers and encompass almost 40% of the Minnesota market. Again, if no language on stop sale compensation is passed this year, our members will be subject to restrictions on moving their inventory and missed sales opportunities imposed by their franchisors without remedy. The balance of the bill, save for a tweak to the language in section four, the R provision, has been agreed to with the manufacturers and is reflected in the Senate language, so I won't elaborate on those provisions further. In closing, I would like to reiterate, reiterate that the state has a role in making these decisions and laying out the framework for the relationship between the big auto companies and Minnesota dealers. When your predecessors enacted the Motor Vehicle Franchise Protection Statute in 1981, they declared that the distribution and sale of motor vehicles within this state vitally affects the general economy of the state and the public interest and the public welfare, and that in order to promote the public interest and the public welfare and in the exercise of its, of its police power, it is necessarily necessary to regulate the manufacturers and dealers. Since then, the law has been updated dozens of times to reinforce its integrity and address situations that weren't anticipated when the law was originally enacted. We have heard the manufacturers say this type of legislation offends the very nature of the relationship between dealers and the factories, that it's a mutual give and take. However, many of our members feel as though there's a lot of take and not a lot of give. They are not in a position to turn down or walk away from the terms of the relationship as they could lose their franchise and their life's investment if they do so. The courts have also consistently ruled that franchise protection laws and updates to them, especially as they relate to warranty reimbursement and surcharge prohibitions, serve, quote, the legitimate local public interest of protecting local small businesses and consumers from harmful franchise practices. We do hope that we will, you will please stand with your dealers to put teeth in the existing law and adopt strong and clear standards that the courts can apply fairly if necessary. Thank you. Thank you, and I think what we'll do is have all of the testimony, and then if we want to call people back up for any questions, we'll do it at that time. So, um, any other testifiers? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the conference committee. My name is Sandy Naren. I'm with the law firm of Messerly and Kramer, and I'm here today on behalf of a trade association called the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. They represent, uh, there's 12 members of that association, and they represent about three out of every four cars sold in the United States. There's also a second trade association of manufacturers called Global Manufacturers. Uh, they tend to be more of the overseas um, operations, Subaru, Nissan, Kia, I think Honda belongs to that association. That group also sent a letter to the House Committee uh, raising concerns and opposing this bill. So manufacturers, two different groups are, have all, both have grave concerns about that this bill is introduced. The, um, the relationship between manufacturers and dealers is generally governed by the franchise agreement that they sign. It's a private contract that is an, entered into between these business partners. It's signed by both sides. Dealers' councils at the national level do have input into this. But when dealers are not happy with those agreements, they come to state legislatures to override their private contracts. This is the sixth time in the last nine years that the dealers in Minnesota have come to the legislature and asked you to override their private contract. I think it's the 10th time in the last 17 years. Uh, during that time, uh, the legislature has chosen not to pass legislation that has not been agreed to by all the parties. And uh, we hope this conference committee will 
continue that tradition. The last five bills that the dealers introduced, uh, they came to us before they introduced those bills. They uh, spoke with us about them and we worked out agreements and uh, we did not oppose those bills. Uh, they did not do that with the bill this year. The, um, we do want to thank Senator Ingebrigtsen and Senator Games for the time that they took in meeting with the parties before they heard the bill in the Senate. Uh, they spent over two and a half hours with all of us in a room together. And as a result of that meeting, we were able to uh, work out agreement on four of the provisions that were mentioned by staff that are in this bill. They are, there are some technical differences in those four sections, mainly because the House did not adopt the agreed to language uh, by amendment on the floor um, following the agreement in the Senate. But those four sections were agreed to. We are disappointed that the dealers are now suggesting that they do not want to abide by part of that agreement and want to rewrite one of the sections uh, on facilities improvement. Um, so we are disappointed that they are backing off of that agreement that we made. Two of the sections that are in the House bill that we still have concerns with, um, as mentioned by staff and by the dealers. One deals with the uh, recall. Um, there have been an increasing number of recalls, uh, mainly because of the Takata airbag situation that has brought the situation to the forefront. Many of the manufacturers are currently reimbursing the dealers for this cost. This is not something that is not being reimbursed by some of them. Um, there has been talks at the national level of trying to work out an agreement so that the law would be the same in every single state. Federal law currently requires manufacturers to compensate dealers for recalls on new vehicles. That is federal law. Um, we prefer to have a national solution on used cars also, but that has not been uh, successfully accomplished as of yet. Um, a, a number of states have already passed legislation on this. They've all done it at a rate of 1% per month or 12% per year. Only one state has gone higher than that rate um, that, that has been enacted into law. We are fine with going along with the 1% rate that has been adopted in most states, but the, the dealers want a much higher rate. They introduced their bill asking for a effective rate of 29% per year. They reduced that to 21% per year, and I think their last offer to us was 18% per year. I would love to receive that kind of return on my retirement account. If I did, I probably wouldn't be sitting in this chair right now. So uh, we do have disagreement about the effective rate of what is paid. We do think they should be paid. Many of them are paid without a law, um, and our hopes are that if the conference committee adopts it, that it is at the rate that it, most states have adopted it at. The, um, and that would also correspond with the same rate that they receive for new cars. The second issue, as uh, was mentioned, that is in contention is the warranty reimbursement section. That their bill is introduced, proposed to adopt language that was adopted in only one other state, in the state of Wisconsin, and is now the subject of fairly intense litigation there. So. It is not a template that most other states are even looking at or considering because it is extremely controversial. Their bill is introduced also wanted to exclude many normal warranty repairs from even being included in the rate that they are being calculated. Um, and one of the bigger areas of disagreement is over whether or not manufacturers should be able to cost recover for paying dealers in Minnesota a higher rate for warranty reimbursement than they pay dealers in other states. Minnesota law currently permits cost recovery. The Wisconsin law that they copied as the template for their this section in their bill also continues to permit cost recovery. And the laws in most states in this country permit cost recovery. So we are concerned about that. The most recent redraft that they sent us um, yesterday on this language on cost recovery is actually more onerous in our view than the language that they introduced originally. So we do have continued concerns about that. In closing, I will just tell you that the cost of maintaining a dealership is thousands and thousands of dollars added to the cost of every car. Groups, the Federal Trade Commission, conservative groups like the Institute for Justice, liberal groups like the Consumer Federation, Sierra Club, 
have all voiced concern over the last decades of the uh, additional costs that consumers pay in order to maintain a dealership. This bill, of course, will just add to that cost, um, and we encourage you to adopt the language that the Senate has successfully been able to work out with um, between the parties on this. We are, of course, particularly frustrated about the fact that uh, all new manufacturers who come online and start selling cars um, are not bound by Minnesota's franchise law. They are able to sell cars directly to consumers, and they are not bound by the costs of this law or the requirements of this law. Tesla, uh, another manufacturer named Elio, uh, a new one that's coming online here in the United States next year called Lincoln Company, are choosing not to set up dealerships and not incur that cost and say that they're going to be selling cars directly to the consumers and saving that cost. So the uneven playing field is, makes this an even greater concern every time franchise laws are tightened even further and increased costs for manufacturers who are bound by the laws versus those who are not. Thank you for your consideration. I'm glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nier. Um Any questions of either Ms. Nieren or, uh, I, I'm sorry, any other testifiers which testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, uh, questions of Ms. Nieren or Ms. Baffes? <laughs> Thank uh, you, Representative Cresha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. I, I'm just, there was one thing that stuck. I heard you say there was an agreement, but then it wasn't agreed to. I was just wondering if we get clarification on that. I, I wanted to make sure that both sides agree that there was an agreement and what, what the perspective is. Ms. Nieren. I'm, I'm glad, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Cresha. Um, following the meeting that uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen and Senator Dames and their staff organized on the Senate side before they heard the bill, we, as a result of that, were able to reach agreement on four of the six sections that are currently in this bill. Not recall, not warranty, but the other four sections. Um, and that has been the language that passed in the Senate and that uh, we assumed everybody agreed to. Recently in the last week, the dealers have told us that they do not want to honor that agreement and they want to rewrite the facilities improvement section, which was one of the four sections that was agreed to two months ago. Um, Ms. Backus. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Krisha, um, when we agreed to this language in um, section 4R, which is on page seven of the Senate language with um, the factories, we said that facility improvements can re be required more often than every 10 years, and then we agreed with them to an exclusion that did not apply to a renewal of existing incentive programs or modifications of those programs. Since that time, GM has required some of their Buick dealers who are part of an incentive program, so they signed up voluntarily to be part of the incentive program, but now they're facing requirements that they must install new exterior signs on their buildings to reflect Buick's new logo, which adds two colors, blue and red, to a silver shield, and I have pictures of that if you'd like. Um, the cost of this requirement of the dealers is um, around $20,000 per store, and that's extremely significant for stores in greater Minnesota, especially in light of the fact that the majority of these dealerships just upgraded the exterior of their stores with signage within the last couple of years. So they made a change as part of the EBAE program that they signed up for and now are being told that that can't stand, that they're required to make new signage. They have to pay 100% of the cost. They can't negotiate a local vendor. They have to use the one assigned by GM. And mm -hmm. if they don't comply, they will be kicked out of this incentive program. Mr. Chair, oh. um, Ms. Nairn. Representative Krisha, um, this was kind of late breaking news that they put this into their bill last week. And here is the response that I received from General Motors in response to their claim. Um, it's part of an essential brand elements program that I think um, Amber just alluded to. It's a program that's been in place since 2009. The program's entirely voluntary. It's been accessed by 125 to 150 Minnesota-based GM dealers. One of the components of the program is to update signs and logos to reflect the GM brand. While there is an upfront cost to the dealers for undertaking the sign logo update, they are reimbursed by GM at no cost to the dealers. So there seems to be a difference of opinion about who's in the end paying for these signs. Sure. Um, Representative Krisha? Is, is there a difference of opinion or a difference of fact? 
Well, Ms. Naren. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Representative Krisha, I can only go by what the information was that came directly. This is directly from General Motors. And, and uh, Representative Krisha, I'm really not taking sides. I just want to know. And I mean, what I see now is, I, like I said, what is the difference of fact? What has changed? Ms. Backus. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Krisha, um, from the communications with our dealers and we received a copy of the agreement, we saw the language they would bear the full cost of it. And I should have said too, so we were seeking one modification then to the language in the Senate bill to say that the exclusion didn't apply to non-substantial modifications to existing programs, but it would still apply to substantial ones. And that is language that is part of the West Virginia law. So we just wanted to make that clarification to say that these requirements that they upgrade every 10 years couldn't apply to um, non-substantial modifications to address this issue. Although it wouldn't change what's happened right now, um, but going forward this would prohibit uh, changes in branding on a whim that our dealers would have to pay the cost for. Okay. Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Senator Dames. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Amber, could you tell me the four pieces that you folks have agreed to, the one on the improvements and stuff, if that's uh, put into law, would that not protect the situation you're just talking of? Ms. Backus. Um, Mr. Chair, members, our council does, thinks it will not, that it needs to be modified further to say that the exclusion only provides to non-substantial modifications, but then it would be up to the courts to determine what that is. This just sets a framework for that discussion. Senator Dames. Follow up, but Mr. Chair, could you tell me, Amber, uh, what bases are basing that? I mean, what makes them think that that would not cover you? This back language. Because um, I know that the, the attorneys were there when, when this was done. So I'm trying to find out why at that time it would work and now at this time there's a change in what their thoughts are and how they change the thoughts from when we had the meeting. Sure, Mr. Chair and um, or excuse me, Senator Dames, I apologize. <laughs> um, so uh, again, we modeled this language off of West Virginia um, and we thought it would um, satisfy this issue. Subsequently, GM came out with this new requirement of our members. Um, we also saw that West Virginia had language that we would like to modify this with that says the exclusion does not apply to non-substantial, or would only apply to non-substantial modifications. So we asked the West Virginia Auto Dealers Association if they were aware of members being faced with this um, a new requirement for the Buick signage, and they were not. So we think it took care of it there. It's our understanding. A follow Senator. up, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Backus, could you tell me what what would all be included in non-substantial changes? Ms. Backus. Uh, let me find the language here from, excuse me one moment. So Mr. Chair and Sen Senator Dames, we are just suggesting then that the language on 7.33 of the Senate bill be changed to say that um, this shall not apply to a program that is in effect with more than one Minnesota dealer on the effective date of this section, nor to any renewal of such program, nor to a modification that is not a substantial modification of a material term or condition of such a program. And again, that is from West Virginia. Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, so you don't, you can't tell me what the non-substantial are then. Can you tell me what, I'm just trying to find out what you're asking to have excluded off this language. So what would substantial be then if you, if you don't, if you don't know what the non-substantial is, what would substantial be? I'm trying to figure out what you're asking to have changed. Ms. Backus. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Our thought is that requiring a $20,000 investment in signage within just a year for some dealers of putting out new signage is a substantial modification. We think this West Virginia language would then limit um, the exception to um, non-substantial modifications. But again, it would be up to the courts to decide if a dealer were to pursue a, a claim under this section. And I think they would argue probably the numbers and investments for a smaller dealership, $20,000 up front is quite significant when you're making $400,000 a year. 
Thank you. A uh, follow up, with Mr. Uh, Chair. Senator, yeah. uh, could you tell me, Ms. Nearing, could we get some substantiation from Buick that that's the way? It, I mean, I guess I'm really would like to know for sure if that if the dealers are going to be charged that or if it's going to be coming back to them, get being reimbursed to them. I, I just uh, um, and maybe uh, Mr. Ines would like to. I will, I will let Ms. Nering directly represents General Motors maybe answer that question. Good morning. Yeah, Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Ward Inus here on behalf of General Motors and I have been in contact with uh, my GM client um, to discuss this, this Buick, what we call the Buick sign issue that has flared up here in Minnesota. Um, and what I've been told is, is very much what Ms. Neeran just, just um, reiterated to you, is that this is a voluntary incentive program that they enter into, um, that there is in fact an upfront cost they, they need to uh, incur with regard to the signs, but over time, the way this incentive program works, that those costs are reimbursed over time. And my folks have told me at the end of the day, there should be no net, no net costs uh, incurred by the Buick dealer. Um, I think the larger issue, though, is you know we, we did, as has been stated, we had a long, arduous, laborious negotiation, attorneys in the room, hashing out those sections. Uh, we thought we'd reached an agreement, and I think it's, it's really problematic that every time there's a business dispute between the parties, a contract dispute, which happens every day in our line of business, that the legislature is the, is the referee or the recourse for addressing those. I mean, this week or this month, it's a so-called Buick issue. You know, in three months, there's probably going to be a Chevrolet issue. I mean, that's just the nature of the business. So I just think this is the wrong venue um, to remedy these kind of disputes or address these kind of disputes. Um, I think Ms. Nearing did, did an admirable job of talking about our concerns regarding the warranty and recall provisions. Um, I think our, our position at GM has been you know, we're not amiss a, a, a at addressing those concerns. We are willing to address some of those concerns. What the dealers are asking at this point is to adopt positions that are complete outliers relative to the other states. I mean, the recall provision in the House position at 1.75 has been adopted by no other state. Um, the warranty language, the labor rate calculation has been adopted by one state. Um, you know, the, the common rule, in in, in the United States is that cost recovery is allowed. Only 14 states prohibit cost recovery. So I think we're asking just for moderation of the position, a position that better reflects where the rest of the country is. Um, and that's why we've had a hard time reaching an agreement on both the warranty and the recall provisions. Um, Senator Ingerson. Uh, thank you. So um, a couple of questions from uh, Ms. Nearing, you said six times that they've come back. Uh, ten over the last how many years? The, uh, can you can you talk to me about how many times you might have come forward with any any legislation? M Ms. Ms. Nearing, Mr. Chair, Senator Ingerbritson, the manufacturers have never proposed during the seven or well, let's say 18 years that I've represented okay. their trade association. They have never initiated any legislation. Okay. Franchise issues I just to want override. Just want to know contracts. if there's any difference. We prefer to deal in <coughs> private contracts. Right. And my uh, <coughs> during those 17 years that <coughs> I've represented the trade association, the dealers have introduced 10 different bills to override their private contracts. There have been 10 different bills. I have a list of all those bills. I have copies of all those bills if yeah. anybody wants to see them. Uh, Re Representative Davids was the author of one of the first ones back in the year 2000. There were bills in 2001, 2003. Um, it, the last five bills that they introduced in 2009, 10, 13, 14, and last year, as recently as last year, Representative Loon carried a bill for them. We did not oppose those bills. Senator. Thank you, and a follow up. And I understand why the car dealers would be coming here. Uh, it, it's, re it's rather touchy, although when we deal with, with contractual franchise agreements, it seems, and that's why I think you've, you've probably have sensed that in the Senate what has happened over the many years that I've been here, or many, I, gee, I can't even believe I'm saying that, but the 11 years that I've been here, I've, uh, I've also had uh, worked under Senator Scheid, Gerlach, Metzen, and Alec Dames, and all of those chairs of the Commerce Committee have have required that when these types of 
contracts come to, you know, if somebody gets gets knocked on by either side, we, we always encourage them to get together and, and, and work things out. And uh, that has just been kind of a rule of thumb in, in the Senate, and that's what happened, I think. Uh, well, I, in fact, I know it did. The, the two and a half hours we talk about, and rather gr grueling hours, I might say, uh, um, <laughs> Um, there came an agreement of uh, the six different points. We agreed upon four coming out of there. So that time was spent, and I think uh, we felt pretty pretty good going forward. And in just the recent time now was when when uh, these amendments came forward, or there was some wanting of some us to add some amendments without agreements, and that's why we held strong uh, that we would just as soon see you back to the table. My other question would be to Mr. Uh, Inus would be. So this, their guarantee that this is going to be paid, and over a long period, of, how long a period of time would they be reimbursed for these changes that, that uh, Ms. Back has brought forward? Mr. Ines. Chairman Senator Engelbretson, you know, I'm not exactly sure about the details of the payback period, but it is an incentive program, and the, hundreds of thousand, the typical dealer, when they enter this program, gets a payout well in excess of $100,000. Now, they obviously, they incur some costs, as Ms. Back has stated, but uh, it's been voluntarily entered into, into, into an agreement. Um, it's been a very popular program. The estimate is that over the course, this was enacted in 2009, 2010, that more than a billion dollars has been returned to, to dealers in Minnesota alone under this program, incentive program. I mean, it's an important part of their uh, the partnership um, that they, the manufacturers have with the dealers. And th the nature of the business is that there's contract disputes and there's disagreements between the, you know, the dealers and the manufacturers, it happens. Mm -hmm. And, and the vast majority of those those get worked out and they move forward and they're, they're business partners and their success is linked. So I just think every time there's an issue like this, I just don't think the legislature is the appropriate venue to address these kind of contract disputes and these franchise disputes. Um, Mr. Uh, Senator. Chair, Mr. Chair, if I can just finish up here real quickly. I don't know if there's gonna be more testifiers or not, but uh, I guess my, my feeling is, is that of, of uh, of, uh, and I, bet I think I've let both parties know, and if I haven't, they now, they now know that, that yeah, moving forward, uh, <clears throat> and I'm gonna support, only support the Senate language today and moving forward to next year, if we're gonna have some negotiations between now and then, mm -hmm. uh, I'd be more t than willing to sit down as well as I'm sure the other senators would to uh, negotiate the other two, or might there might be three at that time, I don't know. There might be four, I don't know. Uh, but I think it's best that, especially if we can be the referees uh, in these types of situations, and, and uh, but understand, I think both the, the uh, producers should understand that we represent the dealers, we really do. And, and it behooves you to, uh, to make sure that you come to the table when, if, if that request ever comes. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I have another <coughs> number of people lined up here. Um, Representative Lunen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would like to speak to that concept of uh, legislating just inside the, the deals that are agreed to. The, uh, uh, I sat on the Energy Committee, and uh, because of the unique relationship between the, the co-ops and the consumers, uh, it isn't an equitable relationship, and so it called for uh, legislative oversight in those situations. This isn't a, uh, an even uh, relationship because of the uh, reduced or, or a lack of options for the dealers versus the manufacturers. And so I feel that if the legislature doesn't at least take a look at based on what is the right thing and wrong thing to do, take a look at things outside of what's agreed upon. We're abdicating a unique role the legislature plays in all of this. Uh, another thing that, you know, when I first looked at this and I'm thinking, why is, the, why is government involved in private contracts? And I had to think about that a long time. And then it dawned on me, again, in the energy committee uh, where uh, we come in and we're um, doing all these mandates for these providers and co-ops and everything, that there's a lot of similarities here and that we do have to come in and weigh in on it, but it should be based on what is the right thing, the wrong thing to do to try to keep balance there. Also, the uh, I'm just really concerned uh, and questioning, you know, there's a, uh, in the Department of Revenue, there's a nine points that determine if uh, an, an individual or an entity is a independent contractor or an employee. And some of the controls, and I, I get it, the intrinsic controls of the um, manufacturers have over the dealerships seem to cross over that. Well, that might be a unique thing of franchise agreements, but I do think we have to at least 
talk about uh, some things outside of the agreement. I think that's the role we should be playing. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen uh, got to one of my questions. That was exactly what does reimbursed over time mean, you know, and, and I think uh, uh, at some point I would like a better idea of what that actually means. Um, there's been some discussion, and I don't not going to put words in anyone's mouth here, but it seemed to me, Ms. Backus, when you were giving your testimony that you referenced the fact that there, perhaps there are uh, disagreements between the dealers and the manufacturers as to uh, the appropriateness of how the existing contracts are being carried out. Is that a, is that a fair assessment of what you said? Now, Ms. Backus. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and Senator Weber, that is correct. And um, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, have there been any court cases as, as involving the existing uh, agreements? Ms. Backus. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Weber, I do know that one of our dealers did sue GM over the warranty reimbursement issue within the last couple years. Um, that case was moving along, um, but it was ultimately settled after a GM representative told the suing dealer that you might win this case, but we'll be in your shop every month to audit you. Senator. I don't know the terms in the end. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, and you know, and, and that's, and I understand that some of those things can happen. Let me let me sort of clarify, and just for your information, Mr. Chair, I'm double booked as far as conference committees this morning, so in case I get called for a vote, I just want you to be aware of that. Um, I understand the reluctance of dealerships to, to probably sue. Uh, nobody likes to uh, incur additional attorney costs. Sorry, Senator Friends. Um, but um, <laughs> but the, uh, the reality of it is, is that this is a private contract. And to what you were mentioning, Representative Lunan, I, I, I hear you, but at the same time, we have to remember that in the case of the co-ops and, and some of the things that we oversee there, we're also dealing with a, a probably a much more governmentally regulated situation than we are in the private contract that exists between the dealer and, and the manufacturer. Um, you know, that being said, I also want to make it clear that my concept of big business is sort of similar to my concept of big government, and neither are too flattering oftentimes. Uh, I think uh, Office A doesn't know what Office B is doing, and as a result, there are foolish decisions that frequently get made by both organizations. Uh, having been uh, intimately familiar with a couple of dealerships, having done appraisal work of facilities for them and that, I understand some of the what to me seem to be inane requirements that manufacturers sometimes put on them. And, um, and it's sort of, uh, they sort of do that carte blanche uh, for all their dealers. Uh, quite frankly, not fully, in my opinion, recognizing the fact that, like government, you, there really is no simple one-size-fits-all solution to a lot of issues. But that having been said, uh, I feel that without the courts having said that there are deficiencies in what the state law has done and provided for, uh, and until there is, uh, it seems to me that we are overstepping our bounds as a legislature when we are changing contract law um, that, quite frankly, in my opinion, hasn't been fully vetted in the courts. And that concerns me. And if we start to do that for one private industry, exactly where will that open door lead to eventually? Thank you. Um, Representative Halverson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, um, I certainly look at um, the businesses um, that we are trying to nurture in, in our communities and any of us who live along a, a major highway corridor, um, this impacts our communities because we're talking about the employees of these businesses and and uh, the consumers of these businesses. and. Um, I have a lot of concern about um, the impact to concern, consumers, and both sides did talk about impact to consumers in terms of cost. Um, frankly, probably because of my healthcare background, I can see that the way that the cost shifts um, of underpayment of warranty um, work would impact the consumer because we shift it back onto the consumer, um, or we shift it onto to, um, our workers with you know lower. Um, pay um, in some way, so I, I, I don't know if I'm reflecting that right, but m perhaps both parties can speak to that. Um, so that would be my first question. I'll have one other question, Mr. Chair. To the testifiers, uh, whoever wants to take it. 
Uh, Ms. Nairn. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Halverson, I think you've raised a good point. I have many letters in my file from the Federal Trade Commission, from the Consumer Federation, from Sierra Club, from conservative groups like the Institute for Justice and other groups. They all agree and actually are on the same letterhead saying that current franchise laws are anti-consumer and that they raise significantly the cost of purchasing a car for consumers. The letters from the Federal Trade Commission, I think, go back over 30 years that I have on this topic. So this is not a new issue uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we find it a little ironic that the dealers are um, digging in on the, this cost recovery issue and refusing to let manufacturers recover any of these costs that they want to newly impose on us in light of the fact that they've introduced a separate bill of their own to recover some of their own costs this session. They have a separate bill to, that they introduced to double the document fee that they charge everybody who buys a car from them. That would net them an additional almost $20 million a year, according to sales records. So we do find it a little ironic that they don't want us to cost recover, but they want themselves to. So there is no doubt that maintaining dealerships cost money. It's just a simple fact of life. And every time franchise laws tighten that noose and make laws that are stricter, uh, it does not keep increasing the cost. And any business who has a state law imposed on them that increased their costs of doing business will pass it on to the consumer. That's just a fact of life. That's not unique to the car industry. That is a fact of life with any business. Uh, Ms. Backus. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Halverson, I do appreciate your question. Um, I would have to say there are differences of opinions, as Representative Krisha alluded to earlier, with regard to the cost of the franchise system. There are studies out there that show we save the consumer's money. Um, the laws also require that dealerships are situated in a place that they provide consumers convenient access to get their vehicles serviced when there are warranty issues or recalls or defects in the vehicles that the manufacturers have produced. That's a very important service that the franchise system provides, we are an advocate for the consumer in those situations um, so that they don't have to worry about um, dealing with the factory on getting those things fixed. Um, with regard to cost recovery, we are only seeking in this law to allow or to put more teeth in so that the manufacturers will pay what they're already required to, and that is the retail rate for reimbursement. Minnesota has general law in 325G, I believe, that says for warranties, producers, manufacturers are supposed to pay the retail rate. This is no different. We just want to put more teeth in the, in the law to ensure that happens. We're not looking to um, re recover costs beyond that. We're looking to um, receive compensation for the fair work we are doing. Because the factories underpay on warranty reimbursement, which is about 20% of a dealership's repairs in their fixed operation centers these days, that puts more pressure on the retail rate consumers pay because that has to be made up, as you said. And it also causes the uh, technicians to be underpaid. A job that typically takes an hour is expected to be done in 20 minutes by the factories, and that affects the take home pay of our um, technicians, both a uh, union and non, and the Teamsters and Machinists have supported what we are trying to do in section one of the bill. Follow up. Yeah, follow up. Um, Ms. Backus, so um, are you saying that um, it's possible that these dealers are already um, operating outside the bounds of what Minnesota law expects in terms of, of <laughs> reimbursement for warranty rate? Ms. Backus. Excuse me, Mr. Chair and Representative Halverson, the dealers or the manufacturers? Sorry, the manufacturers. Ms. Backus. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Halverson, we do believe that is the case. Um, as I alluded to before, we have had um, dealers that um, some have petitioned um, outside of the courts, the manufacturers, to get increased warranty reimbursement rates. And um, some have obliged, obliged um, in one instance, though, when uh, a dealer did that, then all of the other Nissan dealers were faced with surcharges on the card um, because they were now paying what they were required to under law. But yes, we would agree that across the board, our dealers are receiving um, less than they're supposed to under the current law. Ms. Nairn. Mr. Chair, Representative Halverson, uh, it does appear as if the premise for this entire bill is that 
manufacturers are not following, some manufacturers are not following the current law that requires them to reimburse the dealers at the retail rate. That's already current law. Rewriting that law constantly isn't going to change the fact if some manufacturers are not following the law, then they should be sued and they should go to, and you should go to court and impose penalties. And the current law, the current warranty law, Chapter 80E, already has penalties in it, significant penalties. $25,000 a day can be imposed by the court for violation of the current requirement to reimburse them. I will not defend any manufacturer who is refusing to follow the current law, but there are already remedies in law for the dealers. You can rewrite this law as many times as you want, but if some manufacturer is choosing to disobey the law, they're going to disobey the law. So rewriting the law isn't going to help that. I encourage the dealers to bring lawsuits against any manufacturer who is violating this law and let the court impose these big penalties that are currently permitted. Well, Ms. Backus, quick follow-up. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, just quickly, um, I, I did want to add that part of the problem we have issue with going to courts is one, we've had members retri um, retaliate against, as I already alluded to, but also our language on the books right now is vague. So what we are proposing is just to provide more specificity for the courts to look at if somebody were to pursue legal action, and that's what 26 other states have done. Um, instead of having words like reasonable and like, we are proposing laying out a formula that would take some of the ambiguity, ambiguity out of it so the courts would have um, a easier standard to interpret if there were legal action pursued. Uh, rep uh, I'm sorry, Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ines, I want to follow up on Senator Ingebrigtsen's question because um, while we may agree that the court's the proper place to resolve disputes about what's in the language, I think we're asking you a different question, which is can you tell us about this reimbursement, for example, for the Buick sign? Um, I share Senator Ingebrigtsen's concern that it's one thing to say um, who's going to referee, think the courts are an appropriate place. It's another thing to say we can't tell what the rules are. And so if you have any other information um, on that, I think the dealers and I would be glad to hear a little more specificity than I think it's in there. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Trinus. Yeah, Chairman and Representative Friends, you know, I wish I could tell you more at this point. I'd, I'd put a call out to people on Friday, try to get a little more detail. I mean, Senator Dames has, has reached out to me as well to find a little more detail about the specific program and more importantly, the specific fact pattern that's existed in Minnesota with regard to these Buick dealers. Uh, it's a big bureaucracy, so getting an answer and GM on a Friday afternoon was a little challenging, but um, we're working on it, and I told them, uh, you know, the more information we can have, the better we'll be served in this committee um, as far as that issue. Thank Is you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Prescia, maybe you might have an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do. <laughs> uh, so first of all, let me just say thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to the testifier. You're all a group that I respect, and of course, here we are sitting here with a dispute. And uh, the questions that have been raised, because the two groups can't come together, it falls on our shoulders, and, and I, un I respect that. Before I offer the DE amendment, because I think this may be a starting point and get us to where we're going, and I, I know we're missing a couple people, so I don't think at this time we have to do a roll call or anything like that, but I would ask that each side do one thing for me, and that is, like I said, you, you're all very good at this and you know your issues well and you probably know the other side's issues. Could you each articulate the other side's concerns? What I'm looking, because I, I believe what we are here is you're both trying to re remove uncertainty in business practices and what I'd love to hear is step out of your own lens for a second and say this is what the other side's concerns is and that's what they're trying to resolve. That would just be helpful to me. And um, Representative, I, then I'll I offer the DE. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Cresha. Ms. Niren. I do want to express my apologies to the conference committee for right. leaving you with a bit of this mess. I will tell you that we have negotiated in very good faith on this. I couldn't even carry in the file today that has all the counter offers that have gone back and forth between the parties on this. We have flown in the manufacturers multiple times. Um, I think the last chair of the committee said that she was worried that the manufacturers reps who have all flown into town multiple times in an attempt to work this out are going to start having to pay state income tax because they've been here so many times. So we have in good faith tried very valiantly to do this, and I do apologize for our failure to reach agreement on some of these last points. And if I could, Ms. Backus. 
I'm sorry, just and so a representative pre-show. You gave me your point of view. I'm curious, what what is the other side trying to accomplish in this? If you could just answer that, if if you would like. Ms. Nearn. Mr. Chair, Representative Prisha, um, I think the other side is frustrated at the fact that they don't think some manufacturers are following current law. Okay, thank you, that's fair. And, uh, and I understand that frustration. I don't think continually rewriting it will solve that problem. Mm -hmm. If someone's refusing to follow the law, they're gonna refuse to follow the law. So other remedies need to be considered. Ms. Back. Ms. Backus. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Krisha, I appreciate um, the um, Ms. Niren's recognition of that frustration our dealers are facing. And again, we are just hoping to put some more teeth into the law and provide less ambiguity in the language so the courts have a better um, framework if there is litigation pursued. And um, we have been negotiating vigorously um, since the start of the legislative session about these provisions. And we've gotten very close on warranty reimbursement. Um, the one issue that we can't agree to and I don't see how there is compromise is the issue of cost recovery. We do believe that the um, factories should be paying what they're required to under the law and they shouldn't be able to come back and surcharge the dealers for that. Um, I, we modeled our language after Connecticut, which again is the one that was litigated heavily and upheld by the <laughs> Supreme Court. And in the courts, they said that it is appropriate to have a cost recovery prohibition because that's a loophole in the intent of the existing law, and that's how we view it. So we would like the legislature to ultimately decide that provision because we're not going to be able to agree amongst ourselves on it. A representative, Krisha. And thank you. And if you could do as Ms. Neer did, what do you think their uncertainty is that they're trying to remove? Uh, Ms. Backus. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Krisha, I, I do think that, again, they want to be able to recoup those costs, and that's been the big issue going forward. Um, I do think that they would be okay with us pursuing l litigation, but again, some of our smaller dealers don't have the resources when going up against a company that had record profits of $12.5 billion last year. Okay. And so with that, Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with that, I'd like to offer the DE amendment. Um, and if House Research could just walk us through, I think we might be resolving some of the differences in this, and hopefully it's a starting point. Um, Representative Acretia uh, moves the DE2. Uh, could we have an explanation, please? Certainly. Chair and members, um, the DE2 amendment is uh, similar to House File 740 in that it includes a new ADE.041 involving warranty obligations to dealers. Uh, most of the changes involve adjustments uh, to the calculations for reimbursement and exclusions. Uh, if you look on page three, you know, we they remove parts that are not original equipment, uh, parts or their equivalent um, for things that are excluded for determining uh, warranty like repairs. Um, for determination of the fair wholesale value of parts, they remove um, some loose language as otherwise determined. Um, on to section two, um, so dealers are co compensated under subdivision one of section two um, for used cars that have a, a do not drive or stop sale order and this is a change from house file 740. Um, it is now 1.5% of the value of the vehicle per month and I believe it was 1.75. Mm -hmm. Yes, 1.75. 1.75 in House File 740. Uh, an additional section, um, an additional subdivision in Section 2 is added that um, the remedies provided for the exclusive uh, remedies for motor vehicles and they cannot use any other state or federal remedy. And then the language that Ms. Neeran and Ms. Backus um, discussed uh, quite a bit is on page 13 and if you look, it's uh, on the DE, it's lines 13.12 to 13.18. And um, it's a little difficult to read because it creates a, a double negative, but um, it doesn't allow manufacturers to require dealers that participate in lump sum programs um, to replace signage after 10 years if the requirement is a modification that is a substantial modification to a material term. So that's the language. 
uh, Representative Tricia. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, yes, that's my amendment. I, I'll be honest, I think this is a step in the right direction. I think it addresses some of the what I've heard in the agreements, but I'd like to hear to make sure um, I'm not as familiar if this is actually what some of the agreements have been. Um, Ms. Backus, um, comments on the amendment? Sure, Mr. Chair and Representative Cresha, as I am looking at it, um, it does address some of the concerns that Ms. Nieren had in her initial testimony in terms of um, the retail rate for labor on page 3.13. It has moved away from the Wisconsin calculation and now is um, um, reflecting language that's common practice in 24 other states. Um, there are limitations on um, the parts list as well um, that are narrower than originally proposed. Um, with regard to the section two and the stop sale, it does have a lower rate of 1.5% per month compensation. Um, and I would like to correct something that was said earlier. I know at least three states have enacted stop sale compensation at 1.5% this year. I think there are four that are at 1% is my understanding. So that is in line with um, three of the seven states that have um, adopted language in this way. Um, Ms. Backus, do you know which three states those are? Oh, Mr. Chair, I believe it's Florida, Arizona, and Colorado. Thank you. Um, do we have any other, uh, Representative Krish, any other? Follow up? No, again, I would just offer, thank you, Mr. Chair, that I think this is a, a good starting point. I don't think at this point we have to do anything like a roll call. Let's just talk this through, maybe get to a point of a vote, mm -hmm. vote and, and see if we can get to some agreement. Are there other questions on the amendment? Uh, rep or, I'm sorry, Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think mo a lot of this language has already been agreed to as, folk, as these two parties have been working together. An awful lot of this has already been agreed to. It's just that we can't get past the cost recovery. That's the big piece right now is cost recovery. So I think we have to figure out how we're going to get through cost recovery. And there are some ways of doing that. There are ways that you can do cost recovery. There's, there's no question in my mind that we can figure out a fair rate for parts and a fair rate for labor and design a system of reimbursement and leave cost recovery in there. If you've designed a system that both parties agree to of what's fair reimbursement for parts and labor under warranty, and the dealers use that model, there would be no reason for cost recovery. If the dealers step out of that model, there is reason for cost recovery. An example. Let's say that, and I don't know the numbers. I've been asking Amber for some numbers, but uh, I think they're probably pretty hard to get because of the way things float around. But let's say that the part number would be 120% of actual costs they pay the factory. Let's say that's the number. And that's what is decided on. If a dealer starts charging 140%, there's probably gonna be some cost recovery. If they stay at 120%, there's probably not going to be. Now, I understand that's oversimplification. It's kind of, you have to be very careful doing that because it's kind of like pulling the thread here and wondering why the sleeve fell off because they're very interactive. But we have people that have been in the industry for years right at the table there. And there's no question in my mind, if, this, if we want to get this done, that can be done. But neither party wants to full, pull the roots on their shoes out of the dirt and start moving to the middle on cost recovery. I think there's a way of doing that, and that's why we have been pushing so hard in the Senate for them to get together and get this done, because we've talked about infringing on corporate law. We've talked about this and that. I just wish we could get this, this cost recovery done. If that's done, this thing pretty much goes away and it's taken care of. I understand there's recall things out there that need to be worked with. But I really believe if we can get cost recovery, so that both parties are happy with cost recovery, recall will fall into place pretty quick. So like I say, a lot of this has already been agreed to. I don't feel we need an amendment to it because it's pretty much all been agreed to. And uh, until we get the final piece done, there's no use of putting this together because uh, if we're gonna use this, 
it's going to be harder to get the cost, with cost recovery in here, it eliminates the opportunity to work together to get cost recovery taken care of. Um, and we're running up against the clock. We've got three more people that want to testify, uh, or not to testify, I'm sorry, want, want, want questions. Uh, I'm going to go to those three, and, and then we're going to take a recess and come back later and see if we can't, maybe in the interim, maybe this is the day that it all works and you guys come together and when the chairs are all lined up, you're right close to each other and everybody's happy. Uh, that being said, I'm gonna to go to Representative Cresha, then Halverson, and then Inger, uh, Senator Ingram. Thank you, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for all the time I've, I've taken, but uh, or Senator Danes, thank you for that. Uh, here's the question that's burning my mind as I listen to what you go through. Uh, you know, in my experience as a finance person, you know in a business what, what the costs are and what you're trying to recover. Can they send a bill and get that paid? I mean, because if I'm in a business, I know what my costs are, I send a bill and I hope to get reimbursed. Is that not what's happening here? Um, either one of the testifiers, I guess. Excuse me, can you repeat? Ms. Naren. Can you repeat the question? I didn't. I didn't. Sure, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in the world of finance where I come from, you know, I know what my costs are. If I send a bill to recover those costs, I now have an invoice in my records and I'm, it's in the accounts payable, I'm hoping to get paid. Is that not what's happening now? Are they, are they not able to send a bill to get their costs recovered or is there other mechanisms on how these recovery uh, the, cover, the, re the recovery process is going. I just don't understand. I want to follow up on right. Senator Dean. Mm -hmm. Ms. Nairn. Mr. Chair, Representative Teresa, the cost recovery issue deals with the situation where a dealer may send invoices that are out of line with what the deal most dealers in most states are reimbursed for the exact same work. So the mechanism is in place in Minnesota law, in Wisconsin law, and in most states laws to permit the manufacturer to invoice for those additional costs that the dealers are triggering by sending bills that are different than what they're sent in other places. The fact that the mechanism is in place and permitted by law doesn't mean it's used. Um, I am not aware that any dealer in Minnesota has had cost recovery against them, but maybe, is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Backus, uh, Representative Krisha, actually, um, Nissan and Infinity do charge their Minnesota dealers a surcharge. And as I alluded to earlier, Nissan implemented it after one of its 14 dealers asked for a higher rate of warranty reimbursement. Then they turned around and surcharged every dealer $60 extra per vehicle, and, uh, and the Infinity surcharge was a few hundred dollars. And that stopped any other Nissan dealers from pursuing um, getting the fair retail rate under the law so there there are concerns about retaliation with this cost with allowing cost recovery currently Minnesota law is silent on it right mr. chair and no. I'm sorry I didn't know the Ms. Nairn. answer to that but those two card manufacturers that she's mentioned are not members of our trade association I Ms. asked the question of the dealers and of the manufacturers and the trade mm -hmm. association I represent and they said they had not cost recovered in Minnesota to date representative Halverson uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and just briefly, um, as I've uh, listened to this, I came in with a you know really open mind because I um, really agree. In, in the House, as in the Senate, we have a tradition in the Commerce um, Committee of of really working hard for compromise, and and it's one of the reasons I love being a part of this committee, and I have been since I, I started serving. Um, so thanks, Chairman Hoppy, and. Um, for, for your work um, to make sure we get to compromise. But there are times when we don't. Um, and there are times when we're called to make um, tough decisions as, as committee members. And I'm getting a feeling that this is one of those times, particularly when I'm hearing um, that um, the only solution other than the legislature stepping in is to get the courts involved. And um, we know that these would, this would be multi-million dollars worth of, of litigation, um, which would also have an impact on, on consumers. Um, and so why wouldn't we take the first step of seeing if clarifying the law um, actually um, can help uh, alleviate um, some of the problems that we're working toward, as opposed to saying, just take it to the courts. Um, it doesn't sound like that's, you know, we sp pass a lot of laws here that I always say are full employment for empl lawyers' laws. But um, 
if so if we can not do that i think that would be better in terms of of making sure that our local businesses and our consumers are are served so to me this is a a step before we say take it to the courts can we refine minnesota law to make it more clear um, to hopefully push those um, out of compliance dealers into compliance to me, that seems like a logical step. Um, keeping it out of the courts, I think, should be, be our our goal as opposed to, um, you know, promoting multi-million dollar uh, litigation going forward. That could take years. Uh, Senator Ingers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And to the manufacturers, um, both of these amendments you disagree with and you've not worked out yet with, with the auto dealer. Oh, I'm sorry, not amendments. I should say the cost recovery and the... Uh, and, and the uh, reimbursement 1.5, you have not worked that out. Um, Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Ines. Chairman, Ines. Senator Ingerbritson, that, that's correct. Um, and I think the, the, the flash points on the issues that are unresolved is the rate for the recall. You know, it's worth noting that only four states have adopted 1.5. Uh, I think six have adopted 1%. We have offered to be one of those states that are 1%. Um, 40 states have no provision, no reimbursement rate at, for recall. So we think our, our position right now is 1%. We think that's reasonable, consistent with what, where the most of the states are. Um, you know, the cost recovery issue has gotten a lot of, a lot of the attention. I think your point is well taken, Representative Halverson. I think gra adding greater specificity probably has some greater merit has some merit. Um, the cost recovery issue is a little bit distinct. I mean, you can, you can add the, the um, re retail labor rate language that is in the Cresha Amendment, some of those things, the exclusivity list, I think still has some work to do, um, and add some greater specificity in the law that will provide some guidance. Um, and I think you can do that without having a cost recovery prohibition. And to Senator Dames' point, I think if you get greater specificity in the law, on this area, I think the cost recovery prohibition is not necessary. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of my first blush look at this amendment. And I think you're right, Senator Ingerbritz, and I think a lot of these issues, um, we're close on a number of them. The flash points are the rate and the cost recovery issue. Correct? And Mr. Chair, I, I, Mr. I, agree, Senator. I agree with the representative. I don't think we should be <clears throat> creating any more legal fees than we have to here in the legislature. Um, I think we have that discussion many times over in the Senate. Just and I think we're <laughs> somebody with us today will smile real, 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 real broadly on that. But, but, uh, and I think, and I, and I think, I think quite the opposite. I think uh, if we can get people together and get them to, uh, especially in these types of contracts, get them to cooperate with one another, chances are much greater that to keep them, when you have willing both ways, uh, to keep them out of court. So, um, that's just my thoughts. Ms. Neer, and it looks Mr. like you got Chair, one just, quick little comment to make. Just one, just one additional point I would mention. It does appear as if in the Cresha Amendment there is an exclusion for certain warranty-like repairs. Um, there's some language that's of concern to us that um, I think in the last dealer's offer to us they even removed. So, and that would be um, engine assemblies. This appears to be in your uh, exclusion. So that is an additional, in looking at this real quickly, that still is a, of concern also, besides the cost recovery and the recall rate. Okay, we're going to ask the parties to um, Thank you. chat a little more, and um, we're going to recess to the call of the chair. Mm -hmm.